I thought I'd talk to you today um, a little bit about the problem of evil, with which I'm sure most of you are already at least somewhat familiar, and about um, one leading response to the problem of evil called sceptical theism, which has already been mentioned once or twice today. So uh, if nothing else, um, I'm hoping that you'll take away from this talk um, a kind of broad brushstrokes picture of exactly how, uh, well, the gist of how uh, sceptical theism is supposed to work as a response to the problem of evil. So I'm going to do this. Here we go. I'm going to introduce the evidential problem of evil, outline one leading response to it, sceptical theism, and examine one objection to sceptical theism, which I call, this is my label, uh, the Pandora's box objection. Can you hear me okay? Not really. Not really. Okay, it's a bit of adjustment. <clears throat> is that any better? Yes. Okay, we've got to get pretty close. Okay, so uh, I've got jet lag and I may drift into, uh, drift into mumbling or incoherence at any point. If I do, let me know, okay? I'll charge you with that. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, which God are we going to be talking about? The traditional three O's God is the focus here. A God that is omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, and omnibenevolent, all good, roughly speaking. Uh, here is the problem of evil. Actually, there are two problems of evil, so I'll, I'll mention one problem just to put it to one side. Okay, so the first problem of evil is the logical problem of evil, as it's known, and there it is at the bottom of the slide. It has two premises and a conclusion. The first premise is, if evil exists, God does not exist. Why might you think that true? Well, God is all-powerful, right? And he will have the power to prevent evils existing, and he's, he's omnibenevolent. He won't want there to exist any evils. So there really shouldn't exist any evils at all. But premise two, evils exist. Uh, conclusion, God does not exist. Uh, that's the simple, logical problem of evil. Um, not so popular nowadays, um, actually. Uh, usually a stock response to this argument would be something like this. Um, there may be very great goods that God can't have or can't allow unless he allows for certain evils. And under those circumstances, then he may allow those evils in order to obtain those greater goods. So there may exist evils. The existence of evil is not uh, logically incompatible with the existence of this particular deity. So, can you hear me okay, still? still? We still good? Okay, so I'm just gonna put that problem to bed. I mean, may maybe there's some significant problem there, but I'm just gonna put it to one side. Um, the other problem of evil, uh, the one on which I'm going to focus, it's the evidential problem of evil. Um, and again, it, it looks very similar. Basically, it's the same argument, and you, you add a word, right? And that word is, gratuitous, uh, at, least on, you know, at least as the argument is popularly presented. The argument can be presented in a number of different ways, uh, and this is a fairly standard example. Um, premise one, if gratuitous evils exist, God does not exist. God may allow evils if that's the price paid for greater goods, but he's not going to allow gratuitous evils, by which we shall mean evils for which there is no good God-justifying reason, okay? There may be evils. There aren't going to be any gratuitous evils, is the suggestion uh, here. Uh, premise two, but gratuitous evils exist, surely. Uh, hundreds of millions of years of the suffering of the sentient inhabitants of this planet before we even showed up, surely at least some of that is gratuitous from the point of view of this particular deity, it's highly unlikely that there is some good reason uh, for all of that. And, you know, pick your own examples. So the suggestion then is, if, if given that gratuitous evils exist, and given that first premise, it follows that God does not exist. That's the evidential problem. Now, um, most of you, I take it, are familiar with this 
problem. So now let's move on to uh, sceptical theorist responses to the evidential problem of evil. Sceptical theorists, not just sceptical theorists, actually others too, who uh, reject the argument, tend to focus, usually focus, on that second premise. Uh, they say, how do you know that that premise is true? Sometimes they'll try and actually cook up uh, some reasons for the various uh, evils that are <coughs> supposedly gratuitous, but other times they will simply say, um, well, the, the only reason that you think that that second premise is true, just to remind you, it's that gratuitous evils exist. The only reason that you believe that that's true is, because, is, is that you engage in an inference um, of, a, of a certain sort, a no -seum inference. Now, before I give you the supposed inference, I'm going to give you a couple of other examples first. So here is an example of a no -seum inference, as it's known. Take a look in, in that garage. You can't see any elephants in there. Therefore, looking in from the street, therefore it's, it's reasonable to conclude that there are no elephants in that garage. Right? That's a reasonable conclusion to draw. From the fact that you can't see them, it's reasonable to conclude there ain't none there. Okay, call that a no see inference. Um, that works fine with other elephants looking in to the garage from the outside. But uh, those kind of inferences aren't always sound. Um, you can't see any insects looking into that garage from the outside. Uh, but just because you can't see any insects, that doesn't allow you to conclude, reasonably to conclude, that there aren't any insects in the garage. Because after all, there could easily be insects there still. The mere, you know, insects are very hard to observe. Uh, it might well be that there are insects present and they're simply beyond your ability to detect perceptually. Quite plausible, highly likely in fact. So this noceum inference doesn't work. And now it's suggested that the reason that we think that there are gratuitous evils is because we get engage in an inference of the following form. We can't think of any reason why God would allow these evils Therefore, there probably isn't any reason back there in the cosmic garage, right? The fact that we can't think of the reasons means that the reasons are probably not there. So if these evils are, if th these evils are, are then gratuitous evils, they are e evils, or very likely evils for which there is no good justifying uh, reason. And what the sceptical theist does is they challenge that inference. They say, well, it's like the insect case, okay? Just as when you look into the garage, you can't see any insects, that doesn't allow you reasonably to conclude there are no insects back there. So similarly, you try and think of reasons why God would allow all of this suffering, you can't think of any, but you shouldn't expect to be able to think of the reasons that might justify God in allowing these evils. You need to acknowledge your cognitive limitations. For all you know, the reasons are back there, okay? So that's the position that the sceptical theist takes. That is, if you like, the sceptical part of sceptical theism. And notice that actually even an atheist could sign up with, to this bit. Okay? Even an atheist could say, well, I, I think you have a point there. I agree with the uh, logic of the argument so far. Uh, so that's the sceptical thesis, if you like. Um, and then the theism is just theism attached to this particular sceptical position. Here is one of the leading defenders of sceptical theism, Michael Bergman, uh, drawing just the conclusion I've described here. It's a quotation. The fact that humans can't think of any God-justifying reason for permitting an evil doesn't make it likely that there are no such reasons. This is because if God existed, God's mind would be far greater than our minds, so it wouldn't be surprising. If God had reasons, we weren't able to think of. And so, sceptical theism, or let's call it ST. So if sceptical theism, then we have no good reason to think that there's no God-justifying reason for the evils we observe. But then we have no good reason to suppose that any observed evils actually are gratuitous evils. But then we have no good reason to think that the second premise of the evidential from arg argument from evil is true, that the premise that there are gratuitous evils. 
So that, given that, the evidential argument from evil, uh, the evidential problem of evil, uh, is widely considered to be the most significant argument against the existence of this God, um, if sceptical theism works as a strategy, it effectively disarms that otherwise very powerful looking argument against the existence of God. So this is, uh, this is a pretty big victory, if it is indeed a victory. <coughs> uh, sceptical theism uh, has been defended and developed by a range of philosophers, Alvin Plantinga, already mentioned, Peter Van Imbogen, Stephen Weikstra, Michael Bergman, uh, Justin McBrayer, sitting at the back of the room somewhere. Oh, there he is. Uh, but then it also has uh, critics, uh, John Hawthorne, who's also here, uh, Trent Doherty, also here, Richard Swinburne. So, you know, even theistic opinion is, div is divided on whether or not sceptical theism uh, succeeds in uh, dealing with the evidential problem of evil. Uh, sceptical theism faces a range of objections, and I'm not e even going to attempt to outline all of those objections. I'm just going to focus on one objection which particularly interests me, uh, and the objection is this, that sceptical theism uh, generates implausibly strong and wide-ranging forms of scepticism, including scepticism about the external world and the past. And I'm going to call that the Pandora's box objection. The, uh, the, the objection, in effect, is this, is that um, the sceptical theist makes a particular sceptical move in order to deal with the evidential problem of evil, but the scepticism then runs riot. Right? They've let the sceptical genie out of the bottle, they've opened the box, and suddenly they're having to be sceptical about all sorts of other things, ultimately in fairly <coughs> absurd ways, which I'll now spell out for you. Um, so, here's the Pandora's box objection, or I'll start off modestly and then expand the range of the scepticism. So, uh, if sceptical theism is true, then presumably there could also easily be, back there in the cosmic garage, reasons for God, if he exists, to deceive us uh, in many ways. After all, sceptical theism blocks this no see inference too. We can't think of a good reason for God to deceive us about so-and-so. Therefore, there's probably no such reason, right? Uh, if sceptical theism blocks the other inference about reasons for evils, it blocks this inference too. So we can't know, it seems, <coughs> that there's no good reason for God to deceive us about this, that, and the other thing. But then for all we know, God has reason to deceive us, and indeed, as indeed is indeed deceiving us uh, about all sorts of things. Certainly we can no longer reasonably trust anything he says. He might have good reason to lie to us. Uh, precisely this point is made by Eric Wielenberg uh, in a recent paper. According to Eric Wielenberg, sceptical theism entails that we can't reasonably believe any proposition having word of God justification only. You can no longer take God's word for anything <laughs> once you've embraced sceptical theism because, after all, for all you know, he has a really good reason to lie to you, <clears throat> despite the fact that he's good. Uh, here's another seeming consequence of sceptical theism. Um, how do we know that God hasn't got a very good reason to start a false religion by miraculously raising Jesus from the dead. Uh, sceptical theism seems to entail that we don't know <laughs> that uh, God lacks such a reason. After all, the mere fact that we can't think of such a reason doesn't mean that there isn't a reason back there somewhere in the cosmic garage that would justify God in deceiving us in this kind of way. Um, but then why suppose, if you're a sceptical theist, why suppose that the resurrection supports Christianity? Uh, shouldn't, in fact, our sceptical theist now distrust not just what God says, but everything that he might seem to reveal to us? Surely you shouldn't be trusting your revelatory experiences anymore. Maybe they aren't really so revelatory. For all you know, God has a good reason to deceive you by means of these experiences. So you can see that the scepticism is spreading now in what is, for most religious folk, a pretty toxic way. 
Uh, indeed, you might think that uh, you now face a dilemma as a sceptical theist. You wheel out the sceptical theism, you play the mystery card in order to deal with uh, the evidential problem of evil, which otherwise constitutes a very significant threat to what you believe. But unfortunately, the scepticism that you have invoked to get out of jail free then undermines your religious belief beliefs in various other ways. So one way or another, your religious beliefs are undermined. <clears throat> so maybe not such a good idea at, after all to play the sceptical theist card in response to the evidential problem of evil. Initially looks very attractive indeed as a kind of get out of jail free card, but look at the damage it's now doing uh, to the rest of your belief system. <coughs> Let's extend the, extend the range of the scepticism even more now. Scepticism about the external world and past. How do we know that God, if he exists, does not have a reason to deceive us about the external world and past? Uh, Sceptical theism seems to entail that for all we know, there is such a reason. Certainly, we can't infer from the fact that we can't think of a reason why God would deceive us about these things that there is no such reason. That no CM inference is blocked. <clears throat> But then sceptical theism requires, on the face of it, that we distrust our memories and perceptual experiences. We are cut off from knowledge of the external world and the past altogether. The scepticism is now threatening to get global. The Pandora's box has been opened and the scepticism has spread everywhere. <coughs> so how do we uh, deal with this problem? Uh, sceptical theists have grappled with it, they've tried to get the scepticism back in the box. <clears throat> and all I'm going to do today really is, is give you one example of um, how they've attempted to do that. Uh, so now we come to, this is really ingenious, uh, but ultimately I'm not persuaded, but see what you think. Um, so there are a couple of philosophers, um, the first of whom is Baudouin, I'm going to call him, because I don't actually know how to pronounce his name properly. Does anyone know? Baudouin, is that? Baudouin. Baudouin. That sounds so much better than Baudouin, doesn't it? Baudouin. I don't speak French, I'm sorry. Baudouin and Bergman, uh, Michael Bergman, from whom we've already heard, uh, they have a response to the Pandora's box objection. It appears to be, to me, to be essentially uh, the same... Uh, response, although Bergman gives it a little extra twist. So, um, here's the response. Skeptical theism, they say, only blocks certain no CM inferences. Uh, this kind of no, no CM inference. I, that should say, can't think of a God justifying reason for God to do X. It shouldn't say can. Can't think of a God reason justifying. God justifying reason for God to do X, so there probably is no such reason. Uh, so the sceptical theist says, yeah, that inference blocked. You can't make that, given the sceptical part of sceptical theism. But there are other ways we might perhaps know that God lacks reasons to do certain things. In fact, it's not that God's reasons are completely opaque to us. There are reasons that we can know about. Uh, so for example, I can know that God lacked good reason to burn my house down last night because he didn't. Right? He didn't burn it down last night, therefore clearly then God has no, had no good reason to burn my house down last night, otherwise he would have done it. But I know he didn't, so there's a reason that I know, I can know, that I can justify, I believe God doesn't have. So it's not like the, the, um, the domain of God justifying reasons is completely opaque to us. Uh, no, we do have knowledge of uh, some of those reasons or that certain reasons are absent. <clears throat> so, continuing on a little bit more, the bergman bedouin response, uh, we might have some independent, non noceum dependent grounds that allow us to know certain things, X, say, and if we know a certain thing, X, let it be the external world exists, say, right? Uh, then we can know God lacks a reason to deceive us about the external world, okay? If there's some non noceum way of knowing about the existence of the external world, well then I can know that the external world exists, and if I know the external world, the world exists, then I know 
that God lacks any reason to deceive me about it because otherwise I wouldn't then know that it exists. So here is how the Ber Bergman and Be Bedouin uh, attempt to deal with the Pandora's box objection. They're trying to cram the skepticism back in the box. They're trying to allow... Uh, uh, yeah, here it is on the next slide. <coughs> so a bit more illustration. So um, Bergman says that we can commonsensically know many things about the external world and past, such as, I don't know, I've got two hands. <laughs> More's proof of the external world. Um, and we can know that we're not being uh, deceived about these things, okay? Seems quite plausible, doesn't it? So, okay, so now, if I know that I'm being, not being deceived about the external world, and this knowledge is not dependent on my engaging in any kind of no seeing inference, okay, um, then from the fact that I do know that I've got two hands, um, I, can com I can infer that, not, that God has not deceived me about my having two hands, and thus that God lacks good reason to deceive me about my having two hands. Bob's your uncle. We're out of jail. Uh, we've escaped the uh, Pandora's box objection. Uh, so here it is in a nutshell. Um, the Baudouin Bergman response in a nutshell. First of all, only knowledge dependent on no seeum inferences regarding God's reasons is blocked by sceptical theism. Uh, knowledge of the external world and past is not dependent on such no seeum inferences. Therefore, knowledge of the external world and past is not blocked by sceptical theism. Phew. <laughs> uh, the for the sceptical theists, they've managed to claw back knowledge of the external world and past. Whether they can do that trick with the resurrection, I don't know. But we'll put that one, we'll put that thought to one side. So are you, are you with me um, so far? Yeah? So this is, I think, I think this is fair to say, I think this is the probably the leading response um, to the Pandora's object box objection to um, sceptical theism. But there are some other responses too. And um, I'm not going to even attempt to go through the others, okay? Justin McBriar has one, actually. Um, and there's some others, some others too. Okay, so now I'm going to give you, I think we're all up to speed with their response, um, I'm going to give you my worry about this kind of attempt to cram the scepticism back in the box, okay? So, and it involves um, an analogy uh, with another case, uh, which I'm going to call Ollie's Orange, okay? So, um, suppose I seem to see an orange on the table in front of me. Under normal circumstances, it would be perfectly reasonable for you to think that there's an orange there, right? Uh, we're, we're, surely we are entitled to take such seemings at face value if we have no reason to think that there's anything funny going on. Okay, so, I am, on Bergman's view, can commonsensically know that there's an orange there, but now I learn, I obtain new information. Okay, so here's the new information. I then learn that Ollie has a holographic projector that can project convincing looking images onto tabletops. And he also has an urn, there it is, containing balls, an unknown proportion of which are black. I'm clueless as to how many of the balls in that urn are black. Maybe they're all black, maybe none are black, maybe half of them are black. I can't reasonably assign any probability to uh, any of these hypotheses. So I'm just in the dark about how many black balls there are in that urn. Now, here's the thing, I do know this, that if Ollie picked a black ball from that urn, then he projected a holographic image of an orange onto the table. If Ollie picked a non-black ball, then he placed a real orange on the table in front of me. So here's the question, is it still reasonable for me to continue to believe, given this new information, that there's a real orange on the table in front of me. Surely not, okay? That could, for all I know, be a holographic image of an orange. Given this new information, I should now be very cautious, skeptical about the orange. It could be a real orange, maybe it's not a real orange. I don't know. Or, well, I need to be careful how I put this, right? I'm going to focus on reasonability. <laughs> right. 
some people might say, no, no, you can still know there's an orange there. Um, uh, let's not get into that. It seems to me unreasonable, unreasonable at the very least, to say that uh, for me to continue to believe that there's an orange there. I should be sceptical about the orange. Now, that backstory, I learn new information, which surely makes it unreasonable for me to continue to believe that there's an orange there you know, once I've obtained this new information. True, I did originally, perhaps commonsensically, no. Uh, perhaps that there's an orange on the table, but I can no longer reasonably maintain that belief given this new information. But then similarly, if God can put either a real world before me or merely a convincing looking illusion, you know, like Ollie and the orange, and if I'm in the dark about whether God has a good reason to create that illusion, you know, back there in the garage, uh, then I can no longer reasonably trust my senses. I should be skeptical about that orange and the external world more generally, it seems to me. That's what the analogy seems to support uh, that I'm drawing here. And notice it certainly won't do for me to argue like this, Bergman and Boudouin style. But look, I do commonsensically know there's an orange in front of me. Uh, so I can reasonably conclude both that Ollie did not pick a black ball from his urn and did not project a misleading image of an orange onto that table. Clearly, that is no good response to the scepticism that's now been generated. But that is exactly what Michael Bergman is saying, in effect. Um, that is to overlook the fact that this new information about Ollie the urn and the projector gives me reason to distrust the original appearance, despite the fact that my original belief was not in any way grounded in any kind of no seeum inference. I mean, that was not the reason why I held the belief in the first instance or why I considered it reasonable. I wasn't relying on no seeum inferences, but the fact is that once I'm in possession of this new information about Ollie, the urn and the projector, I can no longer reasonably take appearance at face value. And if that's true of Ollie and the orange, then that's true of God and the external world. I should no longer be trusting my senses given this new information, sceptical theism, even if it's true that absent sceptical theism, it's perfectly reasonable to take perceptual appearances at face value. So it seems to me that the Boudouin Bergman response to the Pandora's box objection fails. And that means that the scepticism is still global. They haven't shut the lid on the box. They still have the problem that when they apply their scepticism, in order to get them out of trouble with the evidential problem of evil, the scepticism runs all over the shop and undermines their knowledge of the external world and the past, their knowledge of the truth of the Christian religion, and so on. Uh, they have not dealt with that problem. So they're still faced with that fundamental dilemma, dilemma um, which I presented earlier. Um, atheists, on the other hand, have no problem whatsoever with the sceptical part of sceptical theism. They can sign up to it, it seems to me. Um, they would be someone uh, like this, who knows about the urn <laughs> and knows about the holographic projector, but has absolutely no belief <laughs> in Ollie, uh, who turns the holographic projector on and projects images of oranges with it whenever he pulls a black bull out of the, uh, of the urn. Um, there may be, it may be that, you know, I, I, there, there, there are reasons back there that would justify God if he exists in uh, deceiving me, but I don't believe in a God. <laughs> So the fact that there are those reasons back there is completely irrelevant. It doesn't undermine my belief in the external world. It only undermines the belief of the theist, not my own, not my own reasonable belief. So um, the, skeptic, the skeptical theist, it seems to me, on the face of it, is now in terrible, terrible trouble here um, by signing up to the skeptical part of the skeptical theism, where the, whereas the atheist is in no trouble at all, as far as I can tell. <coughs> So, here's what we've done. Um, I've outlined the Pandora's box objection to sceptical theism, and, uh, and I have examined one response to that, and there are others, um, from Baudin, Baudouin and Bergman. And I've argued here that their particular response fails. Um, there are a number, of the, a number of other responses to the Pandora's box objection, and I examine many of them uh, in my paper, The Pandora's Box Objection to Sceptical Theism, so if you're interested, it's in the International Journal of Philosophy of Religion 2015. If you want a copy of the paper, I'll happily uh, email you a copy of the paper if you email me at that um, address, think at royal 
instituteofphilosophy.org. Don't put the word of in there, that's going to kill it. I'll never reach me. Royal, Inst Royal Institute Philosophy. Uh, dot org if you want a copy of the paper.